All right, our next speaker is Parola Christensen. So all this work just to show this photo. Yeah. <laughs> so I, before I start, uh, I met David at the uh, University of Glasgow in the Department of Computing Science in 2006. There was a workshop on, I forgot the name of it, Dynamics and Inference in HCI or something like that. HCI stands for Human Computer Interaction. And I gave a talk there. And there was one person in the audience who kept interrupting me throughout the entire talk. <laughs> <laughs> Never experienced anything like it. <laughs> <laughs> but she also gave a very interesting talk, and afterwards we had a long chat. And um, what happened is basically I ended up here in the Cavendish Laboratory. I think that's the server sky there down to the right. And this is where all the magic was done. <laughs> and here is where we had a lot of different group meetings, and you can see part of the ceiling is breaking down. But it was still okay. And this is the route to the Coke machine. <laughs> <laughs> and basically both David and I were there very late when David was writing his book. I think you left at about 1 a.m., right? I probably stayed another hour, actually, but I was a postdoc, so what are you gonna do? <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm very thankful for a couple of things. So one is that you always helped me as a postdoc with my uh, research applications in particular. You introduced me to Anna Lou Waller, who I'm now co actively collaborating with. And uh, hopefully I learned some useful things as well. <laughs> so let's see, well you'll see. Maybe you can judge for yourself with this presentation. So I'm gonna talk about next generation text entry. Of course, I am not a psychic person, so I cannot predict the future. I think, however, I can sort of predict what sort of solution principles that are probably gonna be used for the next generation text entry. So first of all, text entry is of course very old. Uh, uh, these cuneiforms and other similar writing systems has been around us for many, many years. Uh, being European, there's a particularly interesting writing system, which I like, which is called Nova Ars Notaria by the English monk John of Tilbury in the 12th century. And what's interesting with this particular writing system is the design process is actually documented. So we know what we were thinking when it's coming up with this writing system. So it was basically a system for copying Bibles, which was very popular at the time. And it was done manually, so it's, it's, a, lot, it's a very labor-intensive task. And the way he was copying these Bibles was he created his own little writing system. So letters were simplified to line marks. Common words then were compressed into a series of line marks and dots. And how do you identify the common words then? Well, you do frequency analysis, in this case in the Book of Psalms. So pretty much the principles of doing any sort of sensible text entry, uh, optimizing speed by minimizing articulation effort of the user, uh, and David System Dasher is an excellent, excellent example of that. I believe there would be a video after my talk uh, featuring Dasher. And also exploiting redundancies in natural languages by creating a language model. Both of these principles have sort of been intuitively known uh, for a, been known for a very, very long time, actually. And it's kind of surprising to see how many text entry methods that are proposed and sometimes even tried commercially that actually don't adhere to these principles. And this is probably one reason why they fail. So that Dasher actually supports both of these principles, which is good. So uh, full marks for that. Now, why do nearly all text entry methods fail? So this is from the Daily Telegraph. And it's writing about me, actually, but let's not get into that. <laughs> So, I've done a lot of work on mobile text entry, uh, and I was kind of interested in it because I made one system that actually did make it commercially. And after I wrote my PhD, I was kind of interested in this fact that there's been hundreds, literally hundreds of text entry methods proposed in the literature, but very few have actually succeeded. Basically, five mainstream mobile text entry methods have been, have, 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 have been adopted by users. Uh, one is graffiti which is not used anymore, but which was quite popular with the Palm PDA devices back in the day. So a single gesture corresponds to a single uh, letter. Another one, or if you, uh, you probably remember the multi-tap and the predictive text uh, systems that nobody uses anymore. They were very, very popular at the time, and there's been tons of research into those, sadly enough. I never did that, though. Uh, the third method is the touchscreen keyboard, right? So you basically transplant your mechanical keyboard uh, onto a touchscreen. And maybe you do some error correction or prediction. Uh, the fourth method is the gesture keyboard, which is my claim to fame, I suppose. Uh, 
which is basically the same thing as the touchscreen keyboard. Well, not quite. I'll get into that in a moment. But instead of type, instead of touching the letter serially, you slide your finger from letter to letter. And there's a catch that actually makes it theoretically better. And recently, I have data that shows that it's actually empirically better as well than the touchscreen keyboard. And finally, there's the physical thumb keyboard. So you basically transplant the mechanical keyboard, but you actually keep it mechanical. And the idea is that users use two thumbs, such as the typical BlackBerry uh, phone. Now, these five uh, methods have been successful. There are literally thousands of mobile text entry methods that have been proposed since the mid-1990s that have been unsuccessful. Uh, in my PhD, I had to do a literature review, so I felt I should probably do something useful and not just write a literature review. So I identified about 22 design dimensions. Nowadays, there are probably a couple of more. I will not go into them in detail, but I have also analyzed a lot of the prominent mobile text entry methods in the literature and compared them to the mobile text entry methods that actually have made it commercially. And I've identified two traits in particular that are shared among all successful mobile text entry methods. A, we have a high effective entry rate. So we have a high entry rate when error rate is controlled within some reasonable tolerance relative to their generation, right? So when they were introduced into the market, they were as fast, but maybe not faster than the existing systems, but at least as fast. Secondly, they exhibit high familiarity. So they're very similar in use in terms of the interaction, in, in terms of the interaction layer presented to the user. And by being very familiar, they also exhibit um, a high immediate efficacy. So this is a technical term that basically means that users can efficiently use the methods within a very, just a very few minutes of exposure. So if we just zoom into the high effective enter rate, so this is a talk I gave at a conference a couple of, this slide is, a, is from a talk I gave at a conference a couple of years ago. So basically we have here word per minute as a function of years of mobile text enter resource. And here we have the ceiling rate, so the record rates from the commercial methods. And here we have the research methods <laughs> ceiling rates that have been proposed throughout the years. So they are way below uh, this line. And this is probably one example why we don't actually succeed. However, there is one interesting outlier here, and that's optimized keyboard, which basically means you rearrange the keys in order to enable people to move their finger faster. So they, are fa they can be as fast and maybe a little bit faster than the commercial and the mainstream solutions, but the problem with them, of course, is that they are not at all familiar to users, and in fact, it takes 40 hours of dedicated practice on average in order to be proficient with an optimized keyboard layout. Now, so it's very, so I think one message is that we need to focus on speed, but how should we focus on speed, right? So there is what I think is a model trap here, but basically in the field, what we do is we typically do A-B testing, so people test method A and method B, and the way we are tested in order to achieve internal validity is that you ask users to basically copy text as quickly and as accurate as possible. Now the problem is, of course, when you write things, you're not actually copying text, you're thinking of something to write, right? So there is a creative bound here. And it turns out, maybe it's not so useful to search for something that affords you 200 words per minute, if you can't really think of something to write at the rate of 200 words per minute. So to, to write basically an A4 sheet of paper is about 500 words, like a JRF application is about 500 words. You're probably not writing your, sorry, junior research fellowship application in two and a half minutes, <laughs> right? So, so clearly there is a bound here, and I've done some research here with uh, Keith, and we basically assume that people are pretty good at their standard desktop keyboard, so we did use crowdsourcing, and we had people using their own standard keyboard, typing, typing, composing text, responding to messages, and we found that people basically were about 67 words per minute on average is the composition rate, when people are asked to actually compose something novel, right? Not just blindly copying something out. Now, we are still below this rate, and what's interesting is that my theory seems to hold, of all the top uh, mobile text enter methods in the literature, they are all mainstream text, mobile text enter methods, except optimized on-screen keyboards, but their problem, of course, is that they do not, do not exhibit familiarity. What's a little bit depressing is that all these things that are proposed in the literature are way worse. So you may not notice Dasher is here, but Dasher is here as an example of mobile text enter, not accessible text enter. It's not really designed as a mobile text enter method. So it's okay to put it in the list here. Now, about high familiarity and high immediate efficacy, we can think of uh, um, 
basically the development of a user using a, a text enter method as performance as a function of time. So I'm going to show you a cartoon sketch. So we have a familiar interface, and that's going to have exhibit about constant performance because we already are experts as a familiar interface. Now we have our unfamiliar inter interface we're introducing to users. At some point, the unfamiliar interface is hopefully going to cross uh, the blue line here, and that's known as the crossover point, when the unfamiliar interface gives the same performance as the familiar interface. So that's the crossover point, and up till then, you're asking the user to invest into your unfamiliar method. Uh, you're asking them to invest because there will be a potential benefit at the end here. Now, a problem is, of course, that this benefit, A, has to be substantial for it to be worth the time investment, and second of all, the performance benefit might be actually be quite small, because it's quite difficult to make something faster than existing solutions. And it might actually be negative, as you saw a couple of slides before, which means it's not surprising that people are not really willing to make this sort of investment. It's even worse than that. So I've done some recent work with a PhD student where we basically were interested in charting um, the difference between objective performance and users' actually perceived performance. So it turns out even if you make things faster, people may not actually necessarily detect the difference. So this was in the context of pointing interfaces, which generalizes quite well to mobile text entry. So even though we have an objective benefit, the perceived benefit might be even smaller. So things are looking very bleak indeed. Thinking of career choice, uh, thinking of my career choice and my career here. But typically in design, you, you basically, you diverge and you explore multiple solutions. And then once you've done your exploration, you converge into a solution here. And it's a very difficult problem here because if we're thinking of uh, different ways of improving the state of the art in old kind of text entry, we might want to think about changing the interaction strategies, but we can't do that because of this argument I just showed you that the learning curve will be prohibitive. We might think, think of different uh, efficient encoding, such as using coding keyboards or different sorts of uh, uh, combinations of uh, gestures and chords and uh, predictive methods. But the problem with that, again, is that that requires a lot of user learning. Uh, we might think about optimizing the layout, but again, we're changing the interaction layer and users are not willing to pay that price. So a lot of the obvious ways of innovating in, in text entry in general are really, really not feasible, actually. And this design space becomes very narrow. In fact, it sort of looks like this. And there's not really much we can do. Now, there is actually light in the tunnel, I think. Uh, so I think there are a couple of solution principles that are worth looking into, and these I call these behavioral principles. But the key message here is because most people here are doing information engineering of some sort, is that the way to realize these behavioral principles is to actually rely on inference. And this will be blatantly obvious in a few slides. So first of all, I'm going to jump into a closed loop from close to open loop. And I'm going to have an example here. So we have the typical touchscreen keyboard, transplanted from mechanical keyboard. Not really suitable for a touchscreen for a variety of reasons. Uh, there is uh, a way to fix this, though. If we have some text, just then, comma, there, white, you can think of it as a traditional touchscreen keyboard, and you can type R, A, B, B, I, T. And that's how you would do it. The problem with a traditional touchscreen keyboard is that uh, even if it's error correcting, it's that it relies on closed loop performance, right? So it's visually guided, it relies on visual guided feedback. So that will always be bounded. As soon as you rely on visual feedback, the user cannot really be very, very fast. Now, if you instead view this as a pattern and you slide, so you push down your finger at the R key, slide to the A key, slide to the B key, slide to the I key, and slide to the T key, you notice, notice it forms a geometric shape. Now you can ask the user to produce a shape, which might be similar in location and in terms of its, its overall traits in terms of a shape. And the system can then calculate a prior probability, given the previous words, just then, comma, there, white. So what sort of, what, what is the likely next word? So you all have a language model in your head. And the likelihood given by a gesture recognizer, and there's many ways of recognizing gestures. Plug in your favorite uh, gesture recognizer. And out comes a posterior probability distribution assigned over all the words. So essentially what we're doing is we're decoding noisy gestures using a combination of gesture recognition and language modeling. <coughs> so this is the original paper with a, a horribly hacky method, uh, but it did work. 
But what's interesting with this is that it forms a writing system in disguise because you can actually forget about the keyboard itself and view this as shorthand gestures. Uh, so this is my PhD. It says discrete and continuous shape writing for text entry and control, but not using a QWERTY keyboard layout. So does it work? Well, A, users can learn to recall 14 word gestures per 40 minute training session automatically. And the immediate efficacy is about 25 words per minute after 35 minutes of practice. And after one minute of exposure, the, the typical immediate efficacy is 15 words per minute. I think the best measure, though, is something I obtained very recently with a PhD student where we actually studied how people use this in the wild over a period of two weeks. And it's surprisingly the naturalistic average enter rate is between 35 and 40 words per minute, which is actually quite fast for a mobile text enter method. Another interesting indication is that we actually start a company and release this as an app, and you get these sort of reviews, uh, which shows that people are somewhat uh, passionate about it. I'm still waiting for my Nobel Prize. So. <laughs> and the key here, the key with this system is that in the beginning, when you are a novice, you, you're exhibiting the same closed loop performance. Instead of touching the key serially, you're simply sliding the key serially. Now it turns out we can actually mathematically predict the average performance when people are touching a series of key or sliding between a series of key. It turns out it's about the same. However, when you repeat with gesture over a set number of times, it gradually builds up in your motor memory. And once it's built up in your motor memory, you can quickly recall it from motor memory. And this allows you to transition from closed loop interaction to open loop interaction which is going to be faster, and which is experimentally also shown to be faster. <coughs> now, there is another trait here which I think is quite in interesting, and that is that basically you cannot ask users to explicitly try to learn a new method. So one nice trait with the gesture keyboard paradigm is that basically users are continuously learning in an unconscious way. So in the beginning, you're a complete novice, and you're doing hunt and peck. You're just tracing out the keys instead of tapping the keys. But as you keep doing this, you become basically a shorthand expert. And you will automatically learn, build up a lot of these patterns in your motor memory. Not all of them, because unfortunately, word distributions are terribly skewed. You will always be somewhere in the continuum between a total novice and a total expert. But it's continuous. And I think one nice indication I had, we had a recent paper where my student was basically uh, looking at how people used more, uh, gesture keyboards in the wild. We actually tracked how much people use the gesture keyboard versus a traditional touchscreen keyboard on their own. And as you can see here, a lot of users actually changed their uptake of the gesture keyboard after the experiment because they were sort of introduced to it, they started using it, and they just liked it better. So this is one way of innovating where we basically stay almost the same, right? For the user, it feels almost like the same thing. Instead of doing tap, 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 just slide between the keys and that's it. Now, there's a lot of challenges still that can be solved. One thing I'm frustrated with is that the commercial methods have terrible recognition performance, actually. So clearly, that's something that could be done, done with that. Maybe I'll do it myself. Uh, and that would be one particular thing I think that is worth focusing on. Now, another principle is path dependency. So this is this idea that we basically end up with a suboptimal system, such as the QWERTY keyboard, uh, for a variety of reasons. And there's a beautiful essay by Paul David, uh, Clio and Economics of QWERTY, which gives you one story. Actually, this has been hotly debated, actually, in the economical history uh, literature. I won't go through that debate. But what is definitely true is that there is a huge resistance to change, and people really prefer to keep their, their traditional QWERTY keyboard. So, how can we leverage that? And how can we get around this very narrow design space? And I think one very nice example is typing on a smartwatch. So if you want to type on a smartwatch, there are a number of solutions for that. They are all slow because they all require either iterative zooming, they reduce the key set, so you have to press a series of keys to get the intended letter, or you have to engage in a very, you know, in some sort of multi-stroke strategy, striking left, right, up, or some sequence that corresponds to a letter. And the problem with this is that we're all slow. We are all bounded about, about 10 to 15 words per minute. And we all actually also demand use of learning. So you get into this learning problem again, right? Is there an eventual benefit? And to make this point really hammer this point home, let's imagine a really, really fast coding technique. So a coding technique can probably get you into 40 words per minute. Now, we know coding techniques takes about 40 hours of dedicated practice for users to master it. So here, here's our two familiar interface. Here's a new smartwatch input method that takes 40 hours of dedicated practice. Let's assume you type five minutes on your smartwatch. So this is the user performance after uh, months of use. 
So you're way worse, and after 480 days, you reach a crossover point, right? So you may not actually, even though there is a limit, you may not actually reach this limit, right, of this point. So it takes a very long time to learn the QWERTY keyboard. Users are familiar with the touchscreen QWERTY, so let's keep it. So what you can do instead is to basically simply miniaturize the QWERTY keyboard. So you make it really, really tiny. You set, let's say, 2D Gaussians on each key. This is actually how your error correction works in your touchscreen uh, keyboard uh, on your mobile phone. And you then combine it with a language model trained with uh, suitable training data, in this case, uh, social, uh, social media data, in particular Twitter. It turns out Twitter is useful for something. <laughs> and then you do your decoding. Uh, apologies to Keith, because I stole your slide here. So you have three observations here. And what you're doing is essentially search. So you're going to guess different letters and eat these observations in sequence. You can also stay in the same observation and generate these tokens that represent different hypotheses for the same observation or the next observation. Uh, you can also generate an epsilon transition, which means uh, ignore the observation. Eventually, you are running out of observations, and then your tokens are, are, are tracking hypotheses. So hypotheses are basically uh, words associated or, or a series of characters associated with probabilities, and you pick the highest probability, and that is the output of the system. So what's interesting with this, and you might notice that this is actually, the source space is technically infinite because you can stay in the same observation and keep generating tokens. So the way to make it tractable is use beam pruning. Now, what's interesting here, and which is the message I want to convey here, is that you can actually have a very, very high performance here without actually changing anything for the user. It's the same as a traditional Android keyboard. It's just really, really, really tiny. So if we, we tested three different sizes here, and as you can see, the enter rate is about 40 words per minute. And the character error rate is actually somewhat acceptable, except for the tiny keyboard where the error rate is hovering at 8% eight, uh, 8 character error rate, which still might be acceptable for occasional use on a smartwatch. So there's sometimes no need to redesign anything. You can keep the behavior the same and focus on the back end instead. Another principle that can be used in order to get out of this very narrow design space is flexibility. So we live in a world where people use, can use a variety of techniques. You might, you might type, you might gesture, you might speak, for instance. And you also make mistakes. And you may want to correct your mistakes in a very flexible way. So here's one example. So you have a speech recognition system. The user tries to speak the cat's at. The system outputs the bat's at. The user then engages in some sort of selection, select bat. And the system outputs the bat's at, dissect rat. <laughs> made up for comic effect. <laughs> the user then hates this, and then people wonder why people don't want to use speech recognition. So, in this magical system, the user speaks the cat sat, the system up with the bat sat, and the user can gesture the word cat, or the cat, cat sat, or the cat sat, or type the cat, or speak it, doesn't really matter what. As long as there is a word confusion network associated with it, it will work. And the system will then locate the error uh, and swap it out, and hopefully be able to correct it. So we have, we, we have uh, this time step one and time step two. We're gonna, the system is guessing a word. The words have associated probabilities. So we add to one, that's a word confusion cluster. You can also have an epsilon transition. So that means we don't think the user inputted a word at the time. And we can connect these words together and create a word confusion network. Now, what we're doing here is we basically have two word confusion network. And then we soften them. So we add a wildcard transition, which means go to the next transition and generate a wildcard word. Or you can have, and we have epsilon transitions, which means go to the next uh, uh, cluster, but do not generate a word. And self loops, which means stay in the same cluster and generate any wildcard word. And now what we're doing is we're basically searching for the highest joint probability path for both of these networks at the same time, using a very similar token passing search strategy. And does it work? Well, if you try to fuse entire sentences made by speech or just a keyboard, you can see the error rate here before, before fusion. So speech recognition error rate is about 27%. The gesture keyboard error rate is about 14%. So this was a, quite a realistic task where people were walking around trying to do something sensible. And after the merge, the word error rate has been substantially reduced. If you also give users a speech recognition utterance but has an error, and then you feed the network a gesture keyboard correction, the corrected word, but you don't tell it the location of the word, uh, or you don't even tell it that it actually should be, that should be a correction, 
then the system can reduce the word error rate from 48 to 28 percent. So it's clearly not perfect, right? But it shows how information engineering can be used to, lev to, to provide people with really flexible solutions, but in practice will provide users A with more flexibility and also in uh, higher performance in terms of reduced uh, error rates. And we haven't really changed anything at all. We haven't forced the user to learn any new particular method. The last thing I want to say, because I'm running short of time, is that there's another principle, and that's efficiency. Uh, so sometimes there is low-hanging fruit that can be picked by just thinking about things in a new way. In particular, if you're a disabled user and relying on something known as eye typing, the typical way to select a letter is to use an eye tracker, and there's a gaze point on the screen tracking your eye gaze. And to select a letter, you have to look at the letter, let's say the letter key, letter key T, and then you start to set timeout, typically one second, and the reason for that is because of the Midas touch problem, right? The system needs to disambiguate an intended selection versus just looking at a letter. So there's a couple of problems with this, right? A, the eye is not a control organ, it's a sensory organ, so it's a very unnatural. B, and, and uh, it, it breaks the flow of thought, right? So when you're trying to write something, you keep have to thinking about this primary task of looking at the dwell timeout. And C, of course, it bounds performance, right? There's, there's a very hard bound on how fast you can go. And in fact, traditional eye typing is very, very slow. And the only thing that can either, is actually substantially better is Dasher. Uh, so there is these guys who have tried to fiddle with adjustable dwell, but there was a recent paper that showed that actually their enter rates are kind of fake because they only work with perfect calibration and perfectly healthy users, which is, of course, not the target audience for eye typing. So it's really only, the only alternative is Dasher, actually, so far. So we will see a video after this talk about Dasher. Now, there is another way to do this, which I actually uh, told you, I think, right, from my post sort of postdoc fellowship. And that's called dwell free eye type typing. So basically, instead of uh, filling with the dwell timeout, we tell users to look around, skipping the space key, and look at the result area. And then we treat this as a speech recognition utterance, right? It's just a signal, and we try to decode it. And hopefully, it can decode it correctly. So first of all, we did a human performance estimate. Does this actually work? So we tested a bunch of people. We had them in the lab. They were using an eye tracker. And what we found is that the enter rates, average enter rate is about four to six words per minute. So this is the entire data set, which is a lot faster than the record enter rates for uh, eye typing ever. And if you look in, in, into this as a human performance model, so you can think about traditional eye typing as being decomposed into two different factors. One is moving the eye gaze at the right location, and the other one is waiting for the dwell timeout. And if you tease these factors out, so you see these curves here represent the overhead time of moving, right, selecting a key. And here we have enter rate as a function of dwell time, which of course you can adjust. Then you can see that for zero millisecond overhead, which is impossible, that would mean that you teleport to the intended location. Yeah. So for any sensible overhead, in fact, the ones that's been measured experimentally is the green curve here, the 300 millisecond overhead. For any sensible choice of dwell time, this four to six minute average bound that we obtain from our human performance estimate is better. So it doesn't matter for any reasonable behavioral parameter, right? For any reasonable choice of overhead time and dwell time, dwell-free eye typing should be faster. Assuming you can do it, of course. So this is the record speed that has been obtained in the literature before us. Eye typing using adjustable dwell with perfect calibration and healthy 20 year olds. And their top enter rate was 20 min word per minute. So that's their bound. So we have a 230% performance uh, advantage compared to them. Now, even more interestingly, in the first session when it comes to eye typing with adjustable dwell, the performance advantage is 520%. Which means eye typing itself is a very unnatural thing, right? So just going back to something that you are more familiar with seems to help immediate efficacy automatically. So uh, I think this is a step change in gaze communication. And actually, there's a paper we're about to write very soon. This is work with Keith. Uh, oh, I have that much time left. OK, good. So I can play my video. And I'm pleased to say that actually this is actually released as a product now. So there is a working decoder. Uh, the error rate is about 8%, the character error rate. But it turns out that it's actually a very usable error rate. Um, and this will, there's an alpha release that's already used. I'm going to show you, a play you a video. It's a bit promotional. Apologies in advance for that. Um, and it will be released as a full product with the Toby Dynavox eye series, which is the biggest uh, eye tracking developer for disabled users uh, in uh, two months, I believe. 
So before I play the video, just very briefly, so it's very, very hard to innovate in this space. The design space is incredibly constrained. But by focusing on these solution principles, going from close to open loop interaction, supporting continuous novice to expert transitions, uh, relying on not fighting this path dependency uh, tendency, and to just try to stick with what already users are familiar with, it, but still affording flexibility in a natural way, and also, of course, to remember that we should do things much more efficient if we can, it's still possible to innovate uh, when it comes to next generation text center methods. So while I cannot promise you that I, I cannot predict what's going to happen in the next 20 years, I think whatever's going to be, be the big thing is going to adhere to these sort of principles. And maybe a few more. Now, I want to finish off by playing a video, which hopefully will work. So with that, I guess I take questions. adapt to individual user gestures, or um, is this a sort of general model for everyone? There is so much exciting things that can and should be done. So of course it should adapt to individual uh, gestures. Both this eye typing system does not. So it is using uh, fixed parameters, but it definitely could. And the same is true with the gesture keyboard, right? Obviously it should learn to particular styles. And another big improvement, but probably a bigger improvement is actually in the language modeling. So adaptive language modeling, well, as you know, right, from your dashboard work, really, really, really helps. So I think one key message, because I'm giving a talk at the Division F at some stage, right, is actually where there's so much information engineering that can be done to improve, right? There are always interesting points, but I believe are really, really interesting information engineering problems. And it's basically a work in progress, so that's a great question. Uh, so this question was about visual feedback, if it's distractful or helpful. I think there is a trade-off here, right? Because it's obviously easier. I mean, there's a very key principle of uh, user interface design is direct manipulation, which builds on the notion that you do things visual and you can see what's happening. So visual feedback is really helpful for users. But if you want to go really, really fast, you basically have to transition from closed loop interaction to open loop interaction. And when you're talking about breaking this creative bound, like supporting things at 67 words per minute, you cannot afford to actually use, um, how should I say, visual feedback to control the error of your input. As soon as you do that, you're bounded at about 30 words per minute, something like that. Which I think Dasher is an example, probably of the best example of a 
actually the enter rate bound with a visual, uh, of a visual feedback based system. I think record race in Dasher is 30 words per minute, or how fast could you go? Yeah, something like that. Okay, I think we're out of time, but Perola did say he'd be available during break if you have further questions. Uh, and